Uh, thank you very much, and I'm glad to see such a big audience out. It's only been a week or so since I've stopped lecturing, so I was almost missing a large class. Um, at any rate, um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to spoil uh, everything that Tad just said because I'm not actually going to talk about research that I do because I work on some very small, intricate little pieces that might go towards helping us understand these data. But this was sort of a fun talk to put together because it brings me uh, back up to the larger scale so that we see where all the pieces fit together. So the idea today is just to bring that sort of full circle. Uh, I've got three topics. I've split them up and then we're gonna see how this one uh, goes through. So let's, let's get started. So the first thing I wanted to talk about today uh, was remote sensing generally, all right? So we're just gonna talk about how it is that we know the things that we know and then we'll get into the climate change piece uh, and we can have some fun with that as we, as we wander our way through. So what is remote sensing? Well, first of all, it's just sensing without contact. So we're not allowed to touch things. So I always tell people when they come for lab tours and other things that this is what my mom used to tell me when I was a kid was to look but not touch. Uh, and now that's what I do for a living. Uh, so that's good because I learned that a long time ago. So we're trying to gather uh, immense amounts of data about almost everything from a distance. Uh, you're doing it right now, okay? So I've noticed that everyone's heads up and you're all facing me, that's excellent. Uh, and sight is the biological analog to remote sensing. So that's literally what we're up to at the moment. Now for us right now, and uh, for those of us that are involved in Earth observation, we're gonna be using electromagnetic radiation to look at the way that it interacts with the surface. So both absorptions, reflections, as well as transmission of that energy and how that actually works. So the next question is basically, how much can we tell about objects by simply looking at them? That's all we're allowed to do, right? We're not gonna touch anything, we're just gonna look. Okay, so let's see what we got. All right, so here we go. Off to Tim Hortons. All right, so could you tell a cooler from a sour cream glazed without the sign? So if I didn't have the sign here telling you what that thing was, how do you think you'd do? Well, we know that we've got, you know, that nice little shape on these ones and this one over here. And some of us can actually taste what that donut tastes like without just by looking at it. I, oh, I know the sour cream glaze. I know what that one is. That's quite a lot of information if you think about it just by looking at it. But we're going to get a little bit more than that. So let's have a look at the fundamentals of remote sensing development. So first of all, how big is the object? So can we see it at all? So if we can't see it, if it's too small to be seen, you don't have a chance. If it's large enough to be seen, we've got a shot. Um, how different is it compared to other things, right? So donuts are donuts, but grass is green, but so are trees. So some targets are really hard to discern and some are very much easier. Uh, how does it change over time? So that's one of the uh, fundamental questions for remote sensing is if we knew how it was this year, how does it look next year at this time? Uh, or does it changing in relationship to uh, other environmental stimuli? So for example, deciduous trees versus conifers. When they're all leafed out, we can tell the difference. Generally speaking, they have slightly different green tones. It's a lot easier if we looked at it over a larger time frame and we could see that one loses leaves and the other one tends to maintain theirs. Okay, so the more you see, the more you know. That's essentially what we're after. And you're gonna see that as part of the sort of science expression of how this remote sensing game works is uh, we're always trying to see more. Now, where did we start? Well, we started a long time ago, okay? So we've been doing this for a very long time. I think this is one of the first selfies ever taken. Uh, this gentleman here is a French gentleman by the last, uh, he goes by the name of Nader. Uh, and he used to take, um, he used to take aerial photo photographs in a picnic basket. This is the basket that he was in, and he'd ride around in a balloon in the 1800s, and he'd take pictures of things. Now, how many of you, say, came from a farming background? And did everybody have a picture of the farm taken from above, usually in the dining room? Yeah. Okay, that's the same thing. So we've been doing that since the mid-1800s, shortly after the advent of photography, actually. We took these sort of oblique photos. This is one of Boston from 1860. That's the first aerial image taken over North America. Uh, now, we did this for about 100 years, but we did it primarily for entertainment. This was entertainment pre-television, pre-radio, pre-anything. Take a picture, look at it, talk about it, isn't this interesting? Uh, it's not exactly high def television, but it is what it is. And then we're gonna fast forward to World War I, okay? That's the first time aerial photography was uh, taken extensively uh, and used for mapping. So here we have a gentleman just dangling off the back of his plane. He's got a camera pointed somewhat obliquely at the ground. Um, and then there's another one over here that's a little bit more vertical. It's the vertical ones that we started liking. Uh, but this is First World War. It's still pretty dangerous, right? Now, uh, Second World War, things get a little bit more serious. We start doing these things a little bit better. But 
it still isn't mapping. In the Second World War, we could find out where the bad guys were, perhaps, and we could map things we didn't have maps for. Uh, but it wasn't like we were doing global Earth observation. Post-World War II, what do we do? Well, post-World War II, we start spying on people, because this is always fun. This aerial photography stuff works pretty good, so then we go high. Right, so we try this out. This is a, a U-2 spy plane. It's been converted. NASA still uses this particular plane. It's the same one that was used in the 50s. Uh, and every single one of these holes on the plane houses some sort of an imaging instrument. They never had a gun. Uh, one of them got shot down. That was unfortunate. So we didn't like that. We thought we'd go faster. All right, so faster than a speeding bullet. This is an SR-71 Blackbird, or a variant thereof. Uh, it's me standing there touching one uh, at a museum. They didn't really put much up for barriers, so I just jumped over the barrier and went over and touched it. And then the security guard came very quickly and asked me to leave. Uh, and then my wife says I shouldn't be brought out in public. Uh, go, go Volvo. Anyways, and everything on the ground behind here is an imaging system of some sort, and I was able to explain it, actually, to the person that was running the museum and tried to get myself not thrown out. Uh, at any rate, so we went faster than a speeding bullet. Well, that works pretty good, but it's pretty dangerous. Uh, so maybe we should go to space. Right, this is still 1950s technology, 50s and 60s. So we're starting to put this together. So off to space, this is spying version three. So we're gonna take these particular canisters here and we're still gonna be using photographic film. Right, so we're gonna take these cameras up, we're gonna put thousands of feet of film in them, right, and we're gonna take images. We haven't invented digital imaging yet. Right? It's, not, it's just not quite ready for prime time. Now, this particular kind of imaging, this is the coronal uh, mission, so this is keyhole. I think it was like 1 through 18. We sent up lots of these to spy on the Russians. So it's good fun. The only problem with it was this is how we captured the film. <laughs> Here's the film. We jettisoned the canister from space. It floated back down to Earth, and you had to have a great big plane, and then it would fly loops in the hope that thunk, it would catch that thing on the way by. This is not yet a reliable technology, 1950-something, OK? So we're not quite there yet. Oh wait, now, about the same time, we figured out how to do orbit, uh, orbital remote sensing. So we're up here with a satellite, and we start staring at the Earth, but we put the orbits out a very long way, so we stick them out a long way from Earth. And these are orbits that are gonna be stationary with respect to where the sensor is looking at the surface of the Earth all the time. So you'll know these as weather satellites. All right, so we started with weather satellites in the, in the 60s as a reliable piece of technology to help us predict the weather. So that's really fun. Now, in the 70s, we thought, you know, if you took that geostationary uh, orbit and you put it a little bit closer to the Earth and you made it sun synchronous, which means it's the same time every day in the sun's world for that, for that, uh, for that imaging system. It's always traveling and passing the equator at the same time. And when we do that, uh, we usually stick them into polar orbits, right? Earth rotating, sensor rotation is this way. I don't know why this does that. There we go. Up and down and around we go. Uh, and if you take it, you're going to take it and you're going to put that sensor a lot closer to Earth, which means you're going to see stuff. Because right? when you're just seeing the whole continents, uh, you know, all of North America at one shot, you don't get very much spatial resolution. So we zoom in a little bit, and the more you zoom in, the more you see. So this is still 1970. So this is now within my entire life time frame. Okay, that we started to do this. And within all the lifetime frame of many of those here today. Okay, so let's then have a look. So we go from balloons to blue screens of death. The, we go from balloons to satellite systems uh, relatively rapidly. So as soon as we achieved flight, then very soon after that, we figured out how to have uh, information for war. And then after that, we figured out how to have information from space for good and not for evil. Okay, so these are the array of systems that we currently have. We still rely a lot on our sun uh, in order to provide ourselves an energy source. Uh, but we've got lots of different kinds of sensors that look, so we can look through the, we're looking through the atmosphere all the time, obviously. Uh, we can see things that are in the cryosphere, things that are in the biosphere, things that are down here in the lithosphere, as well as things that involve the rest of the world's surface. So that's imaging Earth. Now, there's far too many missions for me to cover, and I've got far too many slides, so I have to sort of zip through lots of this, but I'm not going to recall any of these. It's not possible. You need a book to get through them all. But we're going to measure the following sorts of things. So these are measurements, right? So we're not guessing anymore. We're measuring stuff, right? So we've got uh, atmospheric gases and composition. The most successful part of remote sensing has actually been remote sensing our of our atmosphere. It's fairly uh, straightforward and simple to do. Land surface change, that one's really hard. All right, sea surface temperature and color, that's tough. Gravitational anomalies, we'll talk a bit about that. 
as well as things like ice cover and others. So there's tons and tons. Just about anything you can think of, we've taken a stab at. And I thought I'd show you the current effort. So this is uh, the current suite of Earth observation missions that NASA's running. That's just one big space agency. There is many other space agencies on Earth. NASA's not the only player. Uh, but you can see here, uh, there's, there's never, I'm never going to get through them all, but we've had 40 that are completed missions. That's not, we're not doing that. 26 current and 26 planned. All right, so this is a fairly serious affair. Now, there's things up there that are kind of interesting. So GRACE-2, that's this thing right here. Sorry that the resolution isn't quite as good as it should be, but um, that's a, a satellite that just does gravitational anomalies. So it was able to predict the flood that happened in Calgary before the flood happened because it detected a higher ground uh, water level than is normal. It's just that by the time they processed it, it was kind of too late. You're not going to stop it. We just know it's going to happen. OCO2, uh, some of these are number two because it's the second one. Well, OCO1 we actually lost, but that's the uh, Orbital uh, Carbon Observatory. I'll talk a bit more about that one. All it does is look at CO2. They have specific tasks. And then this set down in the corner, I'm going to show you lots of data from those today, but that's Aqua and Terra. Uh, you can guess kind of what they're meant to do just by their names. Okay, so in our world, we're going to talk about a few things. So what's measured? Right, so these are essential climate variables. So I'm going to whip through a few. I don't do atmospheric remote sensing, but uh, here we go. So the atmospheric folk are interested in wind speed and direction. So they have sensors that do all of these things. CO2 and ozone, we have sensors that do these. Radiation, budget, water vapor, aerosol properties, and precipitation. Right? Ocean, I definitely don't do ocean stuff. I'm from southern Manitoba. We don't know what oceans are. Uh, we had a big lake there once, but no ocean. All right, so <laughs> ocean color. Right? Color relates to albedo and, and other things. Wave height, we can measure these things. Sea surface temperatures, sea level, we do that one all the time. For terrestrial things, oh yeah, now we start factoring into things that Craig might do. Uh, so biomass, land cover, glaciers and ice caps, blue screens of death, fire, we do fire, absolutely. Albedo, uh, the, the fraction of photosynthetically active radiation, FPAR, as it goes blue again. Uh, biophysical and plant uh, parameters, soil moisture, there's a, a mission that just went up about six weeks ago. All it's meant to do is measure soil moisture for Earth, that's it. It's not tasked with doing anything else. Uh, snow cover and others and on and on we go. Okay, so that's the end of remote sensing. Next, climate change. All right, so I thought I would start off with some key definitions. Uh, every once in a while when I run lab tours, people come in and they, they start ranting about climate change and I just say, hey, I'm a scientist. I'm not emotionally attached to your beliefs. Um, let's have a look at what we measure, all right? Okay, so climate is going to just describe the average weather for a region on Earth. That's it. I know Fox News here, we're just going to give you the straight goods. All right, so broad scale, systematic patterns, all right? So it's cold in Lethbridge in the winter, we got that, right? We understand. Uh, these are things that are repeated over very long periods of time, right? And then we're going to have these long time scales and blue screens, so you can't see anything, are given to give us uh, changes, of course, things like changes in energy input uh, and organization of the continents are the main drivers. There is no doubt, right? So as the sun uh, begins to peter out, uh, the, the earth is most likely going to cool down. We know that we've had warmer climates in the past because the organization of the continents have been, of course, different than they are now. So I'm going to have you, I'm going to just walk you through a really simple model of how this works. My wife loved this one. She thought this was hilarious. Uh, okay, so here we go. Here we are on our pale blue dot. We live in an aqueous world. Most of the map projections that you get show the continents preferentially, so you think there's more land mass on Earth than there is, but there isn't, all right? Land mass is sort of unusual on Earth. Water, really common, okay, on the Earth's surface. All right, so we're just going to take a whole big globe uh, of water. We're going to imagine we have no continents, and we're going to heat it up with the sun. So this is what's going to happen. It's going to get a little bit warmer in the middle, a little bit cooler at the top. Well, physics uh, doesn't lie. It doesn't like that. It's going to try to balance this off. So you're going to have fluxes of that. So the warm water is going to travel poleward. The cold water is going to travel back down to the equatorial regions. And you're going to have some kind of a heat pump, right? You're going to get a bit of a cycling. That's just basic physics. Then we're going to throw junk in the way, OK? Now we're going to add in a few continents. I don't have an atmosphere in my model yet, right? We're not going to worry about that. But we're just going to throw some junk in the way. And that's going to then perturb that flow. It can do nothing other than that. All right, so we happen to know that this little land bridge right here, which is that area in, in Central America, is what essentially has you know, tossed us into an ice age uh, because it's disturbing the heat flow of Earth. How do we know? We do this every day. 
Ta-da. There we go. This is yesterday, or day before yesterday. I put this together yesterday, so this is the day before yesterday. Uh, and this is sea surface temperatures, the day before yesterday. Okay, so it's a global image of sea surface temperatures the day before yesterday. We do this daily. Every single day we measure these things. Now, and you can see this. This is the Gulf Stream. This is what provides a different climate for Europe than we have in Western Canada. Right, it's a little bit cooler over here. We can see that kind of looping around, getting a little bit colder on this side. Right, essential basic geography. Uh, and now we have physical data to go with it because these aren't just pretty colors. Those are actual temperature measurements. So we know what those are. So then I thought I'd take you on a trip. Trips are fun. Uh, so somebody already said that I like, I like Volvo cars. So I was taken home from the hospital in one when I was born and I still drive one today. Almost the same model, which is frightful. Uh, <laughs> We should buy more. The Swedes didn't get that part right. Make it so your cars die. Um, there's Stockholm. Now Stockholm's an interesting place. Uh, how many people? Like how, how many people do you think live in Stockholm? Can somebody throw out an answer for me? Four, no, that's low. The city of Stockholm itself is sort of like the city of Vancouver, right? So it's kind of small and constrained. It's between a bunch of islands. About 700,000 people live there. It's about two million people in the metropolitan area. All right, so it's a going concern. Very similar to Vancouver in terms of climate. Did you notice where it is? That's 60 degrees north there, folks. Okay, now what's important? No, the Arctic Circle is at 63, six and a half degrees. That'd be right there. At any rate, 60 degrees north is right there. And what's the significance of 60 degrees north in Canada? Uh, it's the top of Manitoba. It's a top, it represents the western provinces border with the territories to the north side. Uh, this is 50 degrees north. You'll notice places like London are north of 50 degrees north. All right, so most, most kids that I teach these days in university they have no sense of this at all. The map is just mystical to them. Uh, we should have this. So I thought, well, you know, geographers can do crazy things. So how about we just throw the, the map, just scooch North America over here a little bit. We'll just rotate it around the planet and then see where it is. Well, there's Stockholm sitting there. There's no two million people in northern Manitoba, okay? Not, not unless they're hiding and we didn't see them. Uh, and uh, thanks, but Paris and Lethbridge actually share approximately the same latitude. It's not Paris here, folks, okay? So we have different climates. We get that. Why? Well, oceans, atmospheres, and where we're positioned on this lovely Earth. Okay, so what is the composition of the atmosphere, just for fun? Dry air contains approximately 78% nitrogen by volume. We've got about 21% oxygen in the atmosphere. That's good uh, for most. Argon's about uh, a little bit less than a percent, so it's a significant constituent. And then we're going to get into the remaining 0.1%, which are the greenhouse gas guys. So that's carbon dioxide, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, and others. And then, of course, there's water vapor, which is continuously uh, changing and exchanging between uh, ocean, land, and, and others. That drives another system. Okay, so that's the simplest model that I can give you. Now we're going to start adding in some complexities, but not much. So this is the sort of thing that we then have to consider as a climate modeling system. It has to have all the parts. Well, it's really tough. A simple system is just that, right? But it's too simple. So the little blue ball with a little bit of a heat and a little arrows and things, that's far too simple. That's not the way the world works. It's just close enough for government work. Okay, but it's, <laughs> it's not government work anymore. At any rate, so now we've got to be able to get a cycle going and we, we charge scientists with being able to put these things together to kind of help us understand things. That's why we have models. Well, it's not easy, folks. I mean, this is, uh, it, it requires a lot of data and we never had these bits of data before. So this is where I step back in was topic number three of what do we know. Okay, so what do we know about the climate system that we have? Well, here's the first uh, important question. So has the Earth's surface warmed? All right, so let's have a look at it. We didn't invent the thermometer until the 1600s. We didn't start using them until the mid-1800s. You know, well, you got them and they're a fun thing to talk about, but why measure? Oh yeah, you know, maybe we should set these out somewhere and measure stuff. Uh, okay, so that's... That's around here, mid-1880s. Now, at this point in time, the Industrial Revolution's fully uh, in swing, okay? So we've, we've come down out of the Dark Ages and we're now starting to mechanize the world. Uh, into the cities we go. And this is what the temperature trends look like. Now, it doesn't matter who's doing the computation. There's always little wiggles and how they average things. And I'm just a remote sensing guy, I don't care. Here are the facts. <laughs> If we have a look at a couple of these important dates, this is the one that gets trotted out all the time. So we look here a little bit before 1900 and we just, I don't know, pick some random value there. We call that about 0.8 degrees Celsius. Now, we know that's over land surface, again, okay? and land surface only accounts for, you know, it's about 
20 odd percent, 21 or 2 percent of the Earth's surface. So we're down a little bit, right? So it's like, oh, oceans have heat in them too. Uh, but if you average these things out, it's getting warmer. We've got that. So then people say the Fox News one is, oh, the sun, it's got to be the sun. That's what drives heat on Earth. Well, you know, I guess if you're a bit simple, it might. But sure, I mean, the sun's important. We got that. You know, no atmosphere. The Earth's a frozen ball. We knew that in the 1860s and 70s, actually. Pull the atmosphere off the Earth. It's a frozen ball. We knew that. Uh, so was it the sun? Well, this is the sun right here. We turn around and look at that, too, right? Crazy remote sensing people that we are. We just couldn't do it a whole lot or very accurately before the 1980s, which some of us remember very well. Uh, so up and down she goes, right? The sun's out, but so it wasn't like 2014 is the hottest year on record. Uh, and we're on just the start of an upswing of a solar cycle. So it wasn't the sun, we got that. The sun's just varying, it's not that. Um, so if it wasn't the sun and we do have this temperature rise, well, what was, what was it? We've got to be able to figure this out. Now we've got the greenhouse gas thing down. We, again, we've known about that since about the 1880s, uh, with the effect that that has. And in the 1890s, they predicted that the Earth's climate was going to warm. Again, nothing new here. Uh, okay, so let's have a look at some data because it's fun. Uh, so here we go. This is the Orbiting Carbon Observatory. So it was launched last July. So some of the data is fairly new, and I can't tell you all, a whole lot about it because we've only been doing it since just the other day, uh, quite literally. But here's what we're going to do is we're going to measure carbon dioxide molecules in the atmosphere. So it measures global quantity of CO2. It characterizes this. The goal is to characterize these things as sources or sinks over time. And it's going to give us a better understanding of the carbon cycle. We know there is one. We just haven't measured it very well. Um, yeah, I got it. Uh, watches the Earth breathe, in, in essence. So here's the first set of data that we ever had out of this. This is average carbon dioxide concentration. Uh, then I was going to show this one, right, which happens to be solar-induced fluorescence. So if you're shining light on plants, and you turn around and look at them, they give you a little bit back. Right? So the, the brighter the colors, the more fluorescence you've got. So we, we understand these things a bit better. Now I'm going to walk you through Terra and Aqua. I've got to go fairly quickly because i only got five minutes to go. But these are our, our flagship satellite systems. Uh, you can have a look at all the different sensors on board. They're different between the two. But let's have a look at what we're starting to do now. Right? So from 2002 to now, we've measured the following things. So that's the time that I've been in Lethbridge since 2002. So global net radiation. This is a monthly average, but we've been doing it since 2002. Right? Global cloud cover. That's, that's March, last March. Right? This is March 2015, average temperature. This is sea surface temperature, March 2015. This is chlorophyll content. So if you want to know where you know, you've got upwelling and downwelling in the ocean, uh, you can figure that out too. Uh, global temperature anomalies, where it was a little hotter, where it was a little cooler than normal, March 2015. And finally, snow cover. This is just a small sample of the kinds of data that are pouring down from these satellites every single day, every single moment we're on Earth. So that's a whole lot of data, right? We've got 40 missions up, we've got 26 operational, that's just for NASA, right? So we've got this up, sorry, I skipped ahead. Uh, it's available to the world for free, so you can actually go and download these things. They're in movie loops, so you can play them and have a look. They're quite entertaining. I usually use them as uh, devices to entertain children in, in classes, and little kids that come to the lab love it. Uh, they, they don't have to believe. They just know. Okay, so history is going to record this moment, I believe, is the point at which we started to understand. Right? That's a very important point. Uh, and climate warming, of course, was predicted in the 1800s. So is it unusual? Well, here's what we know. Uh, 20th century was a little bit toasty. Is this unusual? We're not always sure, right? Have the temperatures changed like this in the past? Well, of course, they must have. The problem is we just don't know anything before about 1900, right? And then, you know, we, we've got the thermometer down, but even that, I'm going to show you some of these data. And before we had the thermometer, all we had was tree rings for a proxy. So here we go. This is the temperature record. For some reason, they picked this number as zero. I, I can't explain that. It should be down here somewhere. But this is the instrumental record is being boxed out for you here. Um, so we understand that, but not very well, because we didn't start measuring these things very accurately. So Arctic sea ice, we just figured out the other day how to redo those data. This is glaciers. Dunk, we know that's been going down. Uh, this right here is sea level. So if we're measuring sea level, it's on the upswing, which would be predicted. And then in 1988, so that's only 26 years ago, we put out a set of buoys, and you'll notice the waving of the line starts to decrease. So that's scientists at work over time. Here we have other things that we have for evidence to bring to bear. 
right? Atmosphere examples from the top of Mauna Loa as well as ice cores. These lines uh, line up. This is carbon dioxide concentration. That's the breadth of the Earth. Up and down she goes. Up and up she goes, continuing on its march. Okay, so it's all about the length of the record that we have, and it's not very long, but don't worry, we've got a handle on most of it. Okay, <laughs> many thousands of measurements are being made. We know we've got a global average mean that's going up, right? The temperatures that we have are as warm as they've ever been for about the past thousand years. Uh, sea level and upper ocean heat content has increased, which is really tough to do. Actually, warming water is not easy. Uh, concentrations of all the major greenhouse gases have increased in the 20th century. Those are measurements, right? Largest seen in, of course, the past 20,000 years. So warming, of course. This trend's first noted um, on the land surface, but we've, uh, as soon as we started taking those temperature measurements, actually, the one thing I forgot to point out because I was rushing through was 1952, we decided to standardize the measurement of temperature, and then the line stopped wiggling so much. Okay, it's just, it's just a period in time, but it's not that long ago. Weather stations are based, uh, are biased, of course, we understand that, and they're point samples, but if we measure temperature on Earth through satellite measurements, it's not biased spatially, and it's a continuous variable, we should have it over space. Uh, so where the measurements made, uh, are made mattered. Uh, the measurements are global now, so where they're made doesn't matter because we're measuring them for everywhere. Anyway, so satellite observations are helping us uh, with our knowledge about these systems. Anyways. I'm going to just zip through these last ones so I get back to the last bit here. So horizons, we've only been doing this for about 20 years, I figure, right, with any real sort of consistency, um, and much less with, with certain variables. Like last year, we started doing some of these other things. Uh, many satellite measurements match what we have for older climate models, and lots of them are being used to further calibrate the ones that we have, uh, and they are part of a continued effort. Uh, so we've just started to measure our impact in a meaningful way. And that is just about that. And I wanted to leave you with this. <laughs> OK, so, so what did it say? It's just, you know, poor polar bear stuck on the last piece of ice. <laughs>